excited for the privilege of being able to speak to you today. And I want to warn you in the very beginning that I'm going to try to work on your will. I'm going to try to get you to develop the will of a champion. Now, I'm not going to work on your will the way a preacher friend of mine did. He was a preacher in a Presbyterian church, and he was trying to raise some money. And the people weren't responding very well to this particular plea for money. So he decided he was going to wire up all the pews with electricity, and he was going to bring the switches up to the pulpit, and he was going to get some kind of a response from the people he was talking to. So he had this wiring job all completed, and the Sunday morning he got up in the pulpit and he said, Now, we're going to build a new church, and all of you that want to give $250, will you please stand up? And he pushed some buttons, and as the electrical juice went through the people, a number of them jumped up, and he said, Ah, oh, this is wonderful. He said, Now, all of you will give $500. Will you please stand up? And he pushed some more buttons, and some more people jumped up as the electrical <laughs> juice hit And finally he said, Now, all of you will give $1,000. Will you please stand up? And he threw the main switch, hoping to get everyone else, and he electrocuted 100 Scotchmen right in their pews. <laughs> going to work on your will this way. I'm going to try to get you motivated. I'm going to try to get you to develop the will of a champion by inspiring you, by telling you the life stories of some of these great champions that I have known. You've got to have a will when the going gets tough. When you're out there on that gridiron and you're perspiring and your back is to the wall, a couple inches left to go to your goal line, it takes will for a man to hold that line. When you're running a race and the perspiration's pouring down your body and you're sucking in hot air, it takes will to keep going when those lungs are about to pound out of your body. When you're involved in anything in sports, you've got to have will. I've never known a great champion, but what that champion had a tremendous will. That's my theme for today, because I believe that what it takes to make a champion in the world of athletics is exactly what it takes to make a champion in every other realm of life. The will of a champion is what all of us need if we're going to reach the top, if we're going to accomplish the task we've set out to do for ourselves. And if there's one thing I've seen in the makeup of the will of a champion, it's this, you've got to compete. You've got to be willing to compete. The basic fact of human life, friends, human existence, is this thing called competition. We'll compete for grades. We'll compete for love. We'll compete in the economic order. We'll compete in music and art and drama. We'll compete against the Soviet Union and the masters of propaganda for 25, 30 years. You must be willing to compete. If you're going to be a champion, you've got to be willing to put yourself in a competitive world, and you've got to let that competition pull you out. Actually, this is the point I want to make, that competition can pull you out. The most important thing in Stimulating the human ego, the human will, the human fire, so to speak, is this thing called competition. A person can't be great without it. I remember talking to an outstanding star of our American Olympic team in Tokyo, Japan, by the name of Sharon Stout. Sharon had won three gold medals. She missed out on a fourth gold medal in swimming because Dawn Fraser, the greatest woman swimmer of all times, came from behind and barely nipped Sharon Stouter at the end of the pool. Think of it. This girl almost won four gold medals. She's 15 years of age. Well, I walked up to her and I said, Sharon, what's the secret of our fantastic Olympic team? Why did we win so many gold medals? And this 15-year-old girl who wants to be an English teacher looked me right in the eye and without dangling a participle or splitting an infinitive, she said, Bob, it's because we're used to competition. In the United States, when we go down on that block, we know the girl on our right, the girl on our left can beat us. When we go in that water, we know we've got to give it everything we've got. That's why in America we break records every week. That's why we've built such a strong team. These boys and girls are used to competing fiercely. She said, I've been competing since I was six years of age. And she said, I believe it has made our team. I agree with Sharon Stout. I think one of the reasons why we're so strong in track and field and swimming and some of these other events in the Olympics is because we've got tremendous competition. And you analyze it and break it down. The events where we're weak in the Olympics is events where we have very little competition. Here is a tremendous analysis of the human race. Wherever people lack competition, they lack greatness. Competition is important. I had this thing happen to me 
When I was in college, I went to a small school in Bridgewater, Virginia, and I had won the Mason-Dixon Conference Championship with a jump of 12 feet 6 inches. Well, at that time, I thought 12 feet 6 inches was a tremendous height. And I was kind of glorying in this great height, and all the people around me told me it was good because in that atmosphere, this was considered a good jump. Well, I transferred to the University of Illinois on a track scholarship, and I'll never forget walking out on the track one day. Boy, my ego was out in front of me, and I had the pole in my hand, and I swaggered out there. I was going to show the boys how to pole vault. I went up to the pole vault pit right in front of my eyes. Three men blazed down the runway and jumped 14 2. <laughs> My ego went out the bottom of my socks. All of a sudden, I realized that my little goal of 12 feet 6 inches wasn't high enough. That if I was going to make that team, I had to go 14 5, 14 6. I began to lift weights as I had never lifted weights before. I began to sprint. An hour after those fellows were gone, I was out there sprinting. I climbed a rope. I did everything I could to build my body. But you get the point? Those three men made me. As I look back in my whole competitive career, that was the most important psychological moment of my career. Those men made me realize my goal wasn't high enough. They pulled me out. This is always what competition does. You notice, for example, just prior to a great Olympic Games, how that the world records start to fall. As these young men and women begin to compete fiercely for berths on the Olympic team, you'll find that world records start to go. Why? Because in the stimulus of competition, the human being rises to the occasion. The human being discovers potential and ability that it never thought it had. Competition is what pulls it out. I can't help but think how this affects national destiny. Do you remember about seven, eight years ago when the Americans controlled practically everything in the world? We had the highest standard of living. We had everything. We were way ahead of everyone else. And all of a sudden, one morning, we woke up to beep, beep, beep. The Russians had the first satellite out in space. You remember the psychological shock that swept through America? You remember how we began to evaluate our programs, our education, and so forth? We didn't even have a missile, and here they were out there, ahead of us. We went on a crash program. Americans began to compete for the first time. We began to expend money. Now we are out there, in many respects, ahead of them. Would we have been there, was it not, for the competition of the Soviet Union? As strange as it may seem, National destiny hinges upon your willingness to compete. Our soldiers are going to have to compete. Our scholars are going to have to compete. Our scientists are going to have to compete. This struggle for the mind of the world involves more than just sports and science. It involves ballet. It involves music. It involves economics. It's the struggle for the mind of man. And we won't win that struggle unless we are willing to compete. There is no greatness in sports, in economics, in life without the willingness to compete. Number two, you've got to be able to think under pressure. Now, I'm aware of the fact that this is one of the toughest things to do in life. I don't know about you, but I find it very difficult to think under pressure. For example, I've gone through a lot of decathlons, 15 of them to be exact. And I know how to run. I know you've got to get your knees high. I know you've got to lean forward. You've got to pick your arms up. You've got to pump those arms. I know how to run. I know the theory of running. But you know, it's a fantastic thing when you get down on that mark and that starter says, get set, and those muscles grow taut, and that crowd grows quiet. I tell you, when that gun goes off, pow, it's hard to sink under pressure. And I'm prone, my arms go every which way, my legs go back here, my head flies back. But you can't run like that. I've gone through many and many a race where I'd be about eight yards behind some of these guys steaming into the tape because I was running wrongly. I didn't think under pressure. Well, you can't do that if you're going to break world records. If you're going to be great, you've got to have an idea what you're going to do. It's got to be so firmly entrenched in your mind that it comes out no matter what the pressure is. I think of Don Scholander, for example, this fantastic 17-year-old boy who won four gold medals for America in swimming in the Tokyo Olympic Games. Well, I watched him in 100-meter freestyle as he was going out there swimming perfectly. The fellow sitting next to me had said, if Don Scholander will just forget style and technique, he'll win the Olympics easily. Well, I thought this expert knew more about it than I did, so afterwards, when Don Scholander had won the first gold medal in swimming for America, I raced down, I had to interview him for NBC Radio, and I jammed his microphone in his face, and I said, Don, did you forget style and technique, or did you... 
And before I could finish the question, this 17-year-old boy grabbed me by the elbows and he said, Bob, you can't forget style and technique in the Olympic Games. Here as no other place, you've got to concentrate on what you're doing. He said, I'll tell you all I was thinking about during that entire race. I had it in my mind, if I could make every stroke as efficient as possible, I could win that race. It was my theory, on the block, in the water, that if I could make every stroke efficient, I could beat those guys. Well, that's exactly why he did beat them, because every stroke was efficient. You know, think about that one for a minute. You boil life down, and all any job is, is making every part as efficient as possible. A, a race is so many strides, or so many strokes, so many kicks. You make everyone efficient, and you win the race. Well, Don Scholander won four gold medals. His name has gone down among sports immortals because he had one thing on his mind. In the pressure of the competition, make every stroke efficient. You've got, you've got to think under pressure. I think, for example, of Bob Shule, this fantastic boy from West Milton, Ohio, who won the 5,000 meters. Well, I didn't think he had much of a chance of winning, and like many other reporters, I went up to him just before the competition, and I jammed the microphone in his face, and I said, Bob, do you think you've got a chance to win the 5,000 meters? Well, he was furious. His jawbone set. I could see the fire in his eyes. His teeth set. He looked at me. He said, Bob, of course I can win the 5,000 meters. I hold the world's record in this event. I've got the greatest kick in the world. He said, I'll tell you how I'm going to win this race. I'm staying 10 yards behind the leader. No matter what the leader does, I'm staying 10 yards behind. When we come off that last curve, I'm going to be kicking. I can outkick any man in the world. Well, I could tell by the determination in that guy's voice that he had a strategy. He had a plan. He knew what he was going to do. Well, you talk about tough. It was tough to fulfill this plan because there was a constant downpour of rain the night before the race. The track was a mass of puddles and water. You could hardly see the starters as they took off on the far side of the track. As the gun went off, Bob Shule swung just behind the leader and stayed 10 yards behind. That was his strategy, to stay 10 yards behind that guy no matter what. Now, he could have lost his head. You know what it means to stay 10 yards behind the leader? It means you eat cinders all the way around. There were five or six guys out in front of him. They were all kicking up... This brick cinders into his face. He kept wiping the cinders out of his face. He stayed 10 yards behind. Now, he could have lost his head. He could have swung to the outside. He could have tried to get out of the pressure and lost that precious kick. And let me tell you, in races like this, it's boiled down to the last bit of power you've got in your body. Well, he stayed 10 yards behind. The bell rang. One lap left to go. The roar of the crowd. Again... He controlled himself. He didn't lose his head in the pressure. He stayed 10 yards behind. As they hit the back stretch, he was in perfect position now. The other boys were beginning to tire. Bob Shule began to make his move. With 200 meters left, as they hit the last curve, he began to move up. He came off that curve. A smile broke across his face. He wasn't eating cinders anymore. The other guys were tired, worn out. This guy, fresh, with a smile across his face, began to increase the lead. Five, six yards. He hit the tape to win easily. That's what I mean by thinking under pressure. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to have a plan. So many people nowadays think all they got to do is go out and hit the world in a wild, impulsive move. You've got to have ideas. You've got to think. Part of the will of becoming a champion is to will your mind to think, to concentrate, to hold its attention on what must be done in the pressure. I think of another form of this thing. Fred Hansen, the great pole vaulter from Texas who holds the world's record at 17 feet 5 or somewhere around there. This fantastic guy was jumping in the Olympics. He had bad breaks. He was behind. The East German boy was out in front. Well, Fred went back for his last jump at 16 feet 8 and a half inches. He had been jumping for nine and a half hours. It was dark. You could hardly see the box. Most of the people had gone. This kid went back, and just as he was going back to make his last jump, the East German boy muttered under his breath, I told you I'd beat you in Tokyo. Well, Fred was fit to be tied. Tied up in knots, the pole wasn't working right, the tension, the pressure of the moment. He went back, and he started to go. When he stopped all of a sudden, and went over, and out of his bag, he took a letter that his father had written him. And on the outside of this envelope... Mr. Hansen had said this, open this in the heat of the battle. 
Well, this guy opened up this letter, and it was a simple letter, but a tremendous thing. The father had said something like this, remember there's a divine being in this universe that cares for you, Fred. Ask him for help, and he'll give you strength. Well, this boy forgot all about the crowd. He forgot all about the crossbar at 16-8. He forgot about the remark of the East German boy, and he just bowed his head. He backed off from the pressure of that moment and just asked God to help him do his best. Picked up the pole, roared down that runway, planted that thing. He bent it. He shot up. He pushed off of it. He went over the crossbar by eight inches. One of the greatest leaps I've ever seen to win the Olympic Games. Now, that, too, is thinking under pressure. Sometimes you've got to back off from the pressure of the moment. Sometimes you've got to detach yourself spiritually or mentally. You can't be great unless you can think under pressure. But number three, if you want to be great in the world of sport, you've got to go through hurt and pain. If there's one thing that makes the will of a champion, it's the will to keep going when your body's hurting when your lungs are pounding out of your body, when you feel the throb in your head and your muscles are giving way and those legs, you can't even feel them. This is where the will of a champion comes out in its greatest form. You keep going. Now, you can't take a tranquilizer in sports. When your body is racked with pain, you can't take a painkiller. You've got to keep going. I have never known of a champion for what he was willing to go through pain. They learned to live with pain. I think of Jim Councilman, the great coach from the University of Indiana. He said he's never seen a world record broken, but what a swimmer went through, three things, hurt, pain, agony. He says, if you want to know when they break records, it's when they're in agony. I saw it in the Tokyo Olympic Games. I watched this boy, this half Indian kid from South Dakota, Billy Mills, tearing down the last 100 yards, 35 seconds faster than his best time ever. His legs were giving way. His lower jaw was dropped. He was in such pain he could hardly move. His whole body was wrapped with pain. Clark, on one occasion, had hit him with his elbow. Clark, the world record holder from Australia, was also dead even with Billy Mills. Right beside Clark was Gamudi of Tunisia. You've never seen a race like it. Six and a quarter miles, and three men were within perspiration beads of each other, struggling. They were literally jumping over men who were falling down. In the roar of 85,000 people, I'll never forget this race as long as I live. It was the most dramatic finish. Billy Mills, this kid just about to fall down, he had been hit by Clark, swung to the outside. Clark and Gamudi battled for first place. They were struggling to get in there. 50 yards left, 40 yards. This half-Indian boy found himself. Legs gone in the pain. He forced himself to pick those knees up and put them down. He went through the pain, struggling, that lower jaw dropping farther and farther. He drove toward the tape, lunged out just barely to beat Clark and Gamuti. Have you ever heard 85,000 people roaring as a guy half wobbling, almost falling down, but with a smile on his face, waves in triumph? And you see the story of every great champion. You've got to go through pain if you're going to be great in sport. Afterwards, I interviewed Billy Mills. His wife had just kissed him. You talk about something to tear you up. Have a wife kiss her champion right before you interview him. I tell you, I was choked up. I could hardly talk, but I jammed the microphone to Billy's face, grabbed him by the arm, and I said, Billy, what you do in the pain? This fantastic guy was quite a dramatic, emotional moment anyway, and he put his arm around me. He could only get out one statement, but he said it twice. Bob, I just kept praying and trying. I just kept praying and trying. They don't quit in pain, friends. They keep going. They keep struggling. I think of Kathy Ferguson, this beautiful 17-year-old girl from Burbank, California. She was competing the backstroke against this girl from France. They were struggling like mad. You talk about pain, you could see her mouth open. She was going through it. She'd bite her lip. She'd keep struggling, struggling. They were within about four inches of each other, everyone roaring. This Kathy Ferguson, I watched her. She kept digging in with those arms. She could hardly feel her arms. She could hardly feel her legs. She just kept digging, digging. She hit the end of the pool just barely ahead of Corona, France. She had set a new world record. Afterwards, I ran down to interview her. All I could think of, I said, Kathy, what'd you do in the pain? And this beautiful girl, her mother was standing beside her. She grabbed her mother by the arm. And tears ran down her cheeks. And she said, Bob, she said, I just kept praying. Please, dear God, help me keep going. Help me keep going. Help me keep going. They don't give up in pain. They keep going. When the pain hits them, they keep struggling. 
The will of a champion does not give up in hurt. I think of a guy like Al Orr. You talk about a fantastic demonstration of this. One week before the Olympics, in the discus throw, as he was trying to catch Danik of Czechoslovakia, Danik had thrown one out about 215 feet. And the pressure was on Al Orr. And he was trying to catch him. And on one throw, he bent in with everything he had. And he pulled a muscle right out of his right rib cage. Tore the whole side. Did you ever injure the middle of your body? I can tell you that the native strength of your body comes from your abdominal region and your back. If you hurt yourself there, you're in trouble. Well, this kid had torn that muscle way down deep into the right side. He could hardly lift up his arm. Bob Giganyak, the track coach from Yale, walked over to me, pulled his baseball hat down over his eyes, and he said, Bob, Al hasn't got a prayer. He's out of the Olympics. Well, this Al order walked into the training room the day of the Olympic finals. He said, take me up. They taped this guy up all the way up underneath his armpit. Now, it would have been heroic if he had just gone out there and tried. The two-time Olympic champion telling the world he was hurt. Not Al Orr. With every throw hitting him like a knife in the side. No painkillers. That guy threw the discus 165 feet. His second throw was 175 feet. His third throw was 185 feet. To make the story short, Al Order bleeding. Threw that discus over 200 feet to win his third consecutive Olympic gold medal. That's what I mean by the will of a champion. They don't quit. They don't give up. I went up to this guy afterwards. I was so choked up. It's one of the most heroic things I've ever seen in sport. And he put his arm around me and he smiled. And he said, now, don't take on so, Bob. I've got a high threshold of pain left. I've got a high threshold of pain left. These guys develop it in hours of practice. When the going gets tough, they put out all the more. When they hurt, they force themselves to keep going. You want an even more incredible story? I think of Dick Roth, this fantastic swimmer in the medley. One week before the Olympic finals in the medley, he goes up to Dr. Bill Yorzik and said, Bill, I don't know what's the matter with me. I got a pain in my side. Yorzik rushed him to the hospital. Sure enough, high blood count, emergency appendicitis. Bill Yorzik, who himself was an Olympic champion, looked at Dick Roth and said, Dick, I hate to tell you this, but I got to perform an operation. It's an emergency. Dick Roth grabbed Bill Yorzik. He said, you can't do it, Doc. I waited for four years for this Olympics. You can't do it now. Well, Dick Roth's mother and father were there. They all got in the hassle. Yorzik agreed to wait one day. This kid, Dick Roth, went out, was trained, body racked with pain. The next day, even more pain. He never stopped training. To make this incredible, irrational story short, Dick Roth not only competed in the Olympics, he not only won the gold medal in the Olympics, he broke the world's record. It was the greatest performance of his life. And every stroke was in pain and hurt. That's why they're champions. Now, I know probably some of you are thinking what a young girl was thinking. I gave this speech in Oklahoma City not too long ago, and she came up to me and she said, Boy, you're right. I don't want to be a champion. This is too good and gutsy for me. <laughs> you know the amazing thing? You go up and talk to these great champions who have broken world records, who hold that Olympic gold medal in their hand. You say, would you do it again? And here's what amazes you. Smiling, effervescing, bubbling. These guys will say, I'd do it a thousand times again. You know why? You get out of life what you put into it. Sure, it hurts to build your body. It hurts to stretch your mind in scholarship. It hurts when you've got to put out. But let me tell you, it comes back to you because you're made stronger. I've spent over 10,000 hours training. If I had it to do over again, I'd spend 20,000 hours because it comes back to you in French, in travel, in discipline. It comes back in the increased will to keep going. It's impossible to be great without pain. There isn't a baby born but what a woman goes through pain. There isn't a great statesman but what he's gone through pain. There isn't a spiritual achievement but what a man goes through hurt and pain. You don't conquer alcoholism or dope addiction without going through pain. You don't get physically fit without pain. What I'm trying to say is every great thing in life, you've got to be willing to go through pain. But lastly, in the will of a champion, there is something that is so tremendous. And it's this. No matter what the record is, they think it can be broken. No matter what has been accomplished, these young athletes think that they can go beyond it. There are three words on every Olympic stadium in the world. 
These three words are Altius, Scythius, Fortius. You know what they mean? Higher, swifter, stronger. Here's the spirit of the Olympic Games. Here's the spirit of every great champion I've ever known. No matter what the mark is, he thinks he can go beyond that mark. He can go higher. He can run faster. They will themselves to break the record. They aim for it, and they do it. I watched in the Olympic Games some of the most incredible performances. I watched Bob Hayes three yards behind the four times 100-meter relay. Now, to be three yards behind the fastest runners in the world, most people would have given up. Not Bob Hayes. He took that baton. He caught him with 50 yards left to go. He beat him by three yards into the tape. They timed him in an 8-7 yard dash. 8-7. Do you believe it's possible? Higher. Stronger. Faster. These young athletes refuse to recognize there are barriers. They keep going beyond the marks. I think of Henry Carr who took the baton, the four times 400 meter relay. He just coasted the first 220 and then blazed down the straightaway in the tape to win for America. They timed him in 44 seconds flat for 400 meters. Higher. Stronger. Faster. I watched Peter Snell, this fantastic runner from New Zealand. He won the half mile just looking over his shoulder. He wasn't even breathing hard. He won the mile, or the metric mile, 1,500 meters. I swear the guy wasn't even perspiring. I interviewed him afterwards, and he talked so calmly. The beads of perspiration had just broken on his arms. Do you know what this means? It means that the human race can do the impossible. Roger Bannister says that Peter Snell could run into 330. But whether Snell does it or not, there's going to be some, some young athlete to come along who's going to go under 330. They're going to go 18 feet in the pole vault. And I think of this boy from Texas, Randy Matson, 20 years of age. He's already put the shot over 70 feet. Wait till he picks up the discus. We've got a 17-year-old boy in Kansas running a mile in under four minutes. Jerry Lindgren from Spokane, Washington, portends to break every world record there is in distance running. I think, for example, California, we've got two pole vaulters over 16 feet, and they're in high school still. Higher, stronger, faster. I watch weightlifters in the Olympic Games, middleweights, who put up weights that heavyweights used to lift. These men are stretching their muscles. They're struggling. They're putting it up. Why? They've got the will of a champion to think high, to think great. Higher, stronger, faster. If you want to be part of this modern world, friends, you've got to think higher, stronger, faster. The greatest champion who ever lived for me was a young man, 33 years of age. He competed fiercely against the world collapsing all around him. He won the battle. He was a fighter. He was one who could think under pressure. In the pressure of hate, he thought love. In the pressure of crime and violence and passion, he thought mercy, justice, forgiveness. In the pressure of lies and propaganda, he thought truth. He hurt. And yet he gave the human race its greatest dream. Higher, stronger, faster. He said a man could lead a better life. He said a man could be a stronger person. A man could run a faster race. A man could be greater. He stretched the human frame to its highest known concept. You know what he said you and I could be? He said a man could be like God. Thank you very, very much.